Good morning and welcome to this Wednesday, July 27th, 2022 edition of Trading Places Live at EarningsBeats.com. I'm Tom Bowley, Chief Market Strategist here at Earnings Beats, and I'll be your host for the next 30 minutes featuring everything you need to know as you prepare for the trading day ahead. Well, we got a pretty good reversal today from yesterday's action in terms of our futures. Uh, right now, with about 30 minutes to go before the open, the diamonds, which track the Dow Jones Industrial Average, the diamonds uh, trading up about six tenths of 1%. The spider, <clears throat> of course, tracking the S&P 500, um, that's trading up almost 1%. And the QQQ, which tracks the NASDAQ 100, is trading up about 1.6%. So really good action there um, across those uh, key ETFs. Seeing rotation, at least in the early going, back into the growth areas. Had a number of key earnings reports out yesterday. We'll get into that in just a little bit. Um, but first, before we get into any of that, let me take you over to Earnings Beats for those of you that are new. <clears throat> just make sure that you're aware. If you go over to earningsbeats.com, we do have a free newsletter. Just simply scroll down right here. You'll see the uh, sign up box. All it takes is the name and email address. It's completely free, no credit card required. You can unsubscribe at any time. It does come out Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays. Uh, just literally published one about a half hour ago, uh, talking about a company that will be reporting after the bell today. Um, very interesting looking chart. Um, it's in the retail space. Of course, retailers have been very weak. But this one particular retailer has been very strong, and they report their earnings later tonight. So I expect we're going to see some really good results. Um, but because it's been so um, strong, I'm wondering if maybe we'll get a buy on room or sell on news kind of uh, scenario. But anyway, those are the types of things we like to focus on. We do focus a lot on earnings uh, and earnings beats, hence the name, uh, earningsbeats.com. But we look at gaps, we look at candlesticks, we look at uh, relative strength. There's a lot of different things we feature and goes into our research. And a lot of that you'll see in our EB Digest article. So again, go on over to earningsbeats.com, make sure you sign up there. Looking at the action from Tuesday, uh, wasn't very good. We had the Dow Jones Industrial Average down 228 points, S&P 500 down 46, NASDAQ down 220. So on a relative basis, there was your loser. The uh, Come down here to the sectors, you'll see discretionary communication services, also technology. Those were your three primary laggards. And when those three are not performing well, you're not going to see a very good NASDAQ. Uh, and that's what we saw on Tuesday. Mid caps down about six tenths of 1%. Small caps down a little bit more than half of 1%. So it was really weakness across the board. But this was something that, uh, you know, I've written about the last couple of days to members saying that that was an area where I wouldn't be surprised once we saw a reversal in the five day moving average of the equity only put call ratio, which was getting down to a multi month low, by the way, showing a little bit of complacency, at least. On a relative basis in this market, it was complacency. And that's a lot of times when you see some selling in the short term kick in. We saw that. I mentioned the first key area to watch was going to be the breakout levels, this double top right here. Notice how that was the bottom, came back up, that was the top, and then we break through. Well, when you go back down, that should provide some support after providing resistance. So that's uh, TA101. Broken resistance becomes support, broken support becomes resistance, that sort of thing. Anyway, there's your Dow Jones pulling back, getting close to those moving averages. S&P 500, 39.20 was support. We closed yesterday 39.21. Couldn't have been a whole lot closer. The NASDAQ came right down to its moving averages. You can see we finished 11.562. I've told members, watch that 20-day moving average. That was 11,556. We finished six points above it. Now we see futures really strong today. Mid caps pulling back, but really not even getting down to the level where it broke out from. Small cap, same thing. So technically, you had a situation where the market rebounded. We had a nice run. It was primed for some profit taking. We saw that. Now we're bouncing. And the only question now is, does the or do the moving averages hold? 
on our major indices to the downside. At least at the open, they appear they're going to. And then the next question is, if they do hold, can we go back up and break out to a new high? Because if we do, this is starting to look like an uptrend. This would That to me would be the next confirming signal that the bottom was in in June and that we are now trending higher. Very important because if you go back and you look at prior bear markets or prior periods where we've really struggled over the last 10, 15 years, when you come out of those periods, that 20-day moving average tends to be a very good signal uh, when it acts as support. So we're going to want to watch that for sure. Uh, from a sector perspective, utilities got back up above their 50-day moving average. This was your leader. Healthcare, real estate, if they sound defensive, it's because they are. When the market pulls back, though, that's normal. You know, I'll get emails sometimes. Well, you know, defensive groups are leading today. Is that, you know, does that mean we're back into the bear market? Well, no. I mean, during a pullback, this is what you would expect to lead. That's normal market behavior. What you don't want to see is when we, if we break out again and these three groups lead to the upside, that would not be a good sign. But leadership from defensive sectors in a downtrend is normal. That's normal market behavior. Discretionary communication services technology lagging during a downtrend is normal. What wasn't normal was back in December of last year when these three groups lagged when the market was going up to the final high. These are the groups that should lead on the upside. It's okay if they lag on the downside. Got to know when it matters, when it doesn't in terms of leadership and those groups that are lagging. 10-year treasury yield. So we have the, uh, well, we had the June durable goods out earlier this morning. Uh, they came in better than expected. They rose 1.9%. The mark was actually expecting a drop of a half of 1%. But if we strip out transports, June durable goods actually rose three-tenths of 1%, which was just slightly above two-tenths expected. Uh, June pending home sales will be out at 10 a.m. May rose seven-tenths of 1%. We're expecting June to drop 1%, one full percentage point. And then at two o'clock today, we're going to get the announcement. So, you know, get your seatbelt on, buckle up, get that crash helmet on. It's going to be potentially a very crazy afternoon. And I always like to try and, I don't know, kind of move back from the minute by minute picture on the chart or even the, you know, 10 minute or half hour chart. I mean, we could see <clears throat> some really volatile action after two o'clock today. Let's get an update here on the 10 year treasury. So right now, 10 year treasury yield is really just kind of flat um, from where we closed yesterday, still a little bit below the 280 level. I find it very interesting, though, that folks have been going into bonds for the last six weeks as we head into this latest Fed meeting. Um, I'm of the opinion this is it. I think this is the last rate hike we're going to get. Whether or not the Fed signals that in their language, I don't know. I think they're either going to talk tough to remain hawkish and make sure everybody realizes that they are on board to take care of inflation. Or if anything, they might change their language just a bit to just say, hey, you know, we're going to continue to look at data. I wouldn't be surprised if they say, hey, we're seeing some signs of um, inflation kind of letting off the gas a little bit, but we're going to remain data dependent. You know, they could say something like that. I don't know what they're going to say. I think the way the market's going to interpret it, though, in my opinion, based on what I'm seeing in the bond market already, is that inflation is behind us. Not that we're not going to still see some inflationary numbers, but essentially all that momentum, that inflation momentum, I think is dying off. And that's what the bond market's telling me right now. We break back down below 270. I think it's almost a confirmation of it. I mean, you go back down to a three, four month low on the 10 year treasury yield. And again, I've said it before, 
I know some of you say, well, you know, you say a lot of the same things over and over again. Well, I have a lot of different people that listen to my show every day. I can't just say something and assume everybody has heard it. This is really important to me because if you drop, you have to understand how interest rates work on both the long end and the short end. The short end is driven by the Fed. When the Fed's raising rates, your one month treasury yield is going to go up. Fed's lowering rates or backs off of the you know, hawkish campaign. Then you've got the one year, or excuse me, the one month that may start to pull back. The 10 year, when you start looking at the longer end of the yield curve, there's a lot of different factors. It's not about the Fed. I mean, the Fed maybe plays a little bit of a role, but one thing a long-term investor in bonds is going to be looking for, or looking at, is inflation. Because if they really were, are worried about inflation, they're going to demand higher yields. You're not going to accept a 3% 10-year treasury if you believe interest rates are going to remain at 6%, or excuse me, inflation. If you believe inflation rate is going to be at 6%. You're losing 3% on your money every year. Why would you want a 10-year treasury that pays you 3% if you believe inflation is going to be 6%? That makes zero sense. That's why when you start seeing buying of bonds, the bond traders are beginning to believe that the Fed is going to basically acknowledge that inflation is over. Now, they may not acknowledge it in this meeting, but they're looking forward, the bond market's looking forward and basically telegraphing to the Fed, hey, we don't see inflation as a problem. And eventually that's where the Fed will go. Whether or not they go there today or not, that remains to be seen. That's gonna be the interesting part. If they raise 75 or 100 basis points and then they remain really hawkish talking about doing it again next month, that could spook the market. We could see a big sell-off right after that. If they do as expected with the rate hike, and then they come back with some language that talks about, hey, you know what? We're gonna be more data dependent going forward. We're not quite sure what we're gonna do. You know, and they don't provide any guidance. I think the market could interpret that as, hey, the Fed believes everything's done. They're not gonna raise again. And that means blue skies ahead for the growth stocks. And that's what could happen at two o'clock. We could be on one end of the spectrum or the other. And I don't know what they're going to say. Just be ready for some pretty wild action after two o'clock today. All right, moving on to the S&P 500. So yesterday we pulled back. Now here, I'm going to use this inspector. The open back on June 27th was 3920.76. 3920.76. That was the highest candle body we have seen since that June bottom. And by candle body, I mean open or close. Here we had price support right at 3,900. We lost it here, came back up for the most part. We were really struggling around 3,900. And then just recently last week, we went up to 4,000, went through 4,000. This has been a little bit of an orderly pullback, I would say. Yesterday's low, 39.10, 20-day EMA, 38.98, got within 12 points. And yet we came back up to close at 39.21, which coincidentally or not, held on to that price support. Now we see futures higher. If you look at the NASDAQ 100, here was the prior high, which was uh, 12,157. There's 12,125. We came back down. We closed at 12,086, which is a little bit below this price, what would have been, what should have been price support. But we closed just above the 20 day moving average, which was at 12,073. Yesterday, in, our, in my daily market report to members, I said I was getting more aggressive as we got down closer to this 20 day moving average. And I was going to use the 20 day as my closing stop. Well, we closed above it and we see futures up today and the NASDAQ leading again. Now, was that going to hold? I don't know. Like I said, we have the Fed meeting at two o'clock. I mean, I could see just about anything today. I think volatility is really going to be picking up. 
I like the gap up, getting us further away from those moving averages, of course. But I wouldn't be surprised to see things go red at some point today. I wouldn't be shocked. Just because we're in a downtrend, we've now got a few days of lower lows and lower highs. Today's open will be nice, but it's not taking out the open. It's not going to take out yesterday's high. So it's very possible we stay in this lower low, lower high scenario, at least in the short term. But how do we close? Do we close above the 20? I mean, maybe we just take back off again. I don't know. Uh, that would be awesome. But if we get back up and can clear this prior high after testing, successfully testing the 20 day moving average twice. Remember, we did it back here on the NDX. Went up, came back down to the 20 and then went higher, took out these du this double top to come down, hit the 20 and go up again. That is really starting to paint a much, much more bullish technical picture, which would corroborate some of the other technical signs and sentiment signs back in mid-June. All right, one thing uh, yesterday, Walmart. I mean, that was one of the big reasons why the market got hit as bad as it did. Walmart came out, they cited inflation having an impact on consumers. They issued caution and the stock got hit. What I found interesting about the Walmart chart is that after the huge selling we saw back in mid-May, we got all the way down to about 117 and a half. The lowest close was about 118. And yesterday with this bad news, yeah, we gapped down, but we held support. I mean, I would still be watching this 117 and a half, 118 area. I think as long as Walmart holds that, I think the stock's okay at this level. Now, is it one of my favorite stocks? Of course not. Went down on heavy volume, it bounced back up and then got hit you know, more bad news, another shoe dropped. I want stocks that are performing well and outperforming the S&P 500. I don't want stocks that are doing this, especially as they head toward earnings. I want stocks that are performing really well going into earnings. So Walmart dropped a little bit of a bomb. Of course, here is the XRT. This is a widely diversified retail ETF. Hundreds of companies in this ETF. I think the largest holding is probably somewhere around one and a half percent. I haven't looked in a while. But from what I recall, it might be like somewhere between one and a quarter, one and a half percent. So this is not heavily influenced by any one company or even a group of companies. This is all of retail. And you can see continues to trend lower, not only trending lower, but you can see here relative to the S&P 500 continues in this downtrend. One piece of good news is that on a relative basis, it bottomed back in May. So when the S&P went down, or excuse me, when retail went down and set new lows, or really just kind of put in a double bottom. But as it was going back down, you can see that the relative low was actually higher. And even with this weakness yesterday, we're still, still got a little bit of room down to that May low on, the, on a relative basis. All right, um, I wanna show you, you know, yesterday in the daily market report, I provided a stock to members that I thought had a really good chance to bounce into the afternoon. It was MedPace. Um, they reported earnings. I, I mean, they reported earnings that beat on the top line, beat on the bottom line. And then they issued some, some guidance going forward because of foreign exchange issues. Now, <clears throat> I looked at the stock and I liked it going into its earnings. I thought it was trading pretty well going into its earnings. I loved the AD line. So while it's been going up, that AD line's really been soaring, went to a 52 week high. So what that tells me is that early weakness tends to be a great time to go long MEDP. Well, after that, little bit of guidance that they, they issued, the weak guidance because of foreign exchange issues, the stock got absolutely killed. I'm gonna show you an intraday chart. Look at this five day chart, look at the morning action. Now I sent out, well, I, I did the actual, I put the chart in the daily market report to send out to members literally almost right on the bottom. And I was just telling members, hey, this is a stock 
that I think could have a nice reversal. Unfortunately, I didn't actually send the DMR out for probably 45 minutes because I was writing the rest of the DMR. Um, but look what this did. Now, it probably went out sometime around here. Because again, it takes me usually an hour and a half to two hours in the morning to write the, the daily market report. So depending on at what point I put the chart in there, but I put the chart in right at around 1045 from what I remember. And then it was probably 1130 or so when the report went out. But even from there, I mean, you can see off the bottom, this stock recovered almost 10% second half of the day. I don't think that was coincidence. This was a stock that had been trading really well and looked like it was being accumulated going into earnings. And then earnings come out, which by the way, were, were pretty good. They beat top line, beat bottom line, but they issued this little piece of guidance, weak guidance because of foreign exchange issues. And I saw it gap down and, I, and then I saw it absolutely, you know, going lower and lower and I was just watching it. And if you, again, if you go back to the daily chart and you see that it's got this strong AD line, that tells you that stocks with strong ADs tend to finish in their upper half of their trading range for the day. So this short-term inefficiency because of coming out with an earnings announcement I thought was potentially setting up for a nice afternoon. Potentially. You got to keep your stops in play. You got to know how much you're willing to lose. But the other thing is you can keep your position size small if you're really worried about it so that even if it doesn't work out, you're not going to lose a lot. Anyway, you can see that now on the chart. Looks like a pretty nice hammer on the 20-day moving average. So I thought, okay, well, what I'll do is I'll show you how you can use this information going forward. So one of the things we do at Earnings Beats is we keep a strong AD chart list. This houses probably, <clears throat> I don't know how many right now, maybe 400 companies that, in my opinion, have strong AD lines. One other thing that we do, and you can get this just by being a free Earnings Beats Digest member, is we publish these upcoming earnings chart lists every week so that you know every day what companies have reported since the prior day's close. So for instance, this upcoming earnings chart list, 726 after the market close, 727 before the market opens, this houses all of the companies that reported earnings yesterday after the close and this morning before the open. So if I run this scan, what it'll tell me is it's gonna give me all the stocks that are reporting earnings, that just reported earnings, and also are on our strong AD chart list. So there's probably 400 on the strong AD chart list and probably 100 on the upcoming earnings chart list for, um, you know, either yesterday or today, yesterday afternoon or this morning. And by running this quick little easy scan, and you just do it by pulling up chart lists in your chart list account at Stock Charts. So it's pretty simple. Anyhow, once you run this scan, it'll give me all the stocks that just reported that are also, that also have strong ADs. And so when I run it, there they are, I have 22. So this just narrows down the list of companies that just reported and have strong ADs. Now, why would this be good? Well, first thing I would do is just maybe save this into a new chart list. Um, we'll call it uh, 999 um, earnings with strong AD. So now I've got it in a chart list. Now this is giving me what they did yesterday, but in about five minutes when the market opens, we'll come back, if I remember in five minutes, we'll come back and we'll take a look at this list. And we'll see how these stocks open today. Now I could go and show you all the upcoming earnings. How many of them are there? Do edit. So there are 136. So I said there were like 400 strong AD. There were 136 
upcoming earnings, um, earnings that were just reported. And if you combine those two chart lists, those 22 stocks that I just saved in that chart list are companies that are on both of these chart lists, okay? But what I can do is once you have this downloaded from the EB Digest, again, it's a great free newsletter. I mean, who else gives you all this information summarized in one location? This is free. So you can now take this when the market opens and it's going to tell you which stocks have done well and which ones have not at the opening bell. This is giving us yesterday. So this isn't really critical. But, you know, one of them that reported was Shop, Shopify. We could go up here and just see what Shopify is doing. But if you wanted to find what each one of those stocks was doing after earnings, you'd have to do this 136 times for each stock. You know, what is Meta doing after they reported? What's Google doing after they reported? What's Microsoft doing after they reported? I mean, if you want to do that 136 times, you can. Or you can just come back into this chart list. And here they all are on one chart list, saved, ready for you. They're numbered, in case you're interested, they're numbered in market cap order. This would have been the afternoon, starting with 0001. And then this morning starts with 1001 in market cap order. You want to know how many are in each sector that report earnings? Sort it by sector, sort it by industry group, number of banks reporting. Of course, that number is starting to dwindle each day. But I don't know, there might be an area you're looking for. Maybe you're looking for semiconductors and you want to know what semiconductors are reporting. There you go, three of them together. Texas Instruments, Teradyne, Silicon Labs. I mean, you can do this after you do the sort by you know, percentage change. You can do it by sector and see if there's a particular sector that is doing really well or doing really poorly. There's a lot you can do with this list. Anyway, we'll come back to it in just a couple minutes. One question I wanted to address, this was a member's question, was talking to me about sustainability ratios and was questioning that you know some of them don't work sometimes. Well, first thing I'll say is there is nothing that I'm aware of that works all the time. I think evaluating the stock market is like putting pieces together in a jigsaw puzzle. If you take a jigsaw puzzle that's a thousand pieces and put five of them together, you're probably not going to be able to tell what that puzzle looks like because there's still 995 more pieces to go. When I look at the stock market, to me, it's a big, great big puzzle. And all you're doing is putting as many pieces together to try and figure out what that puzzle looks like. They are not always going to work. You can always find some pieces that are bearish. You'll always find some pieces that are bullish. You'll find some pieces you don't know what the heck they mean. What you're trying to do is put as many of the pieces together as you can to come up with the narrative and what the story, what the market is telling us. So as far as the sustainability ratios that I use, you know, sometimes they might be right. Sometimes they might be wrong. But if most of them are heading in a certain direction, I'm going to feel pretty good about what I'm seeing in the market and what I'm seeing in terms of my sustainability ratios. But the main question that came up was, you know, I've talked about the XLY, XLP being one of my favorite ratios. Well, it is my favorite ratio. It's my favorite intermarket rela uh, relationship to look at. And it, the reason not only does it make sense technically looking at the chart, but it also makes sense, makes good common sense. It's consumer discretionary versus consumer staple stocks. And the reason why it's so important is that consumer spending makes up two thirds of our GDP. Wouldn't it be a good idea to know where that spending is going? Is it going into discretionary? You're not gonna spend on discretionary items unless you feel good. That's when you spend, you know, 
if you're feeling like, okay, things are really going horribly. I don't know if I'm going to keep my job. Um, you know, the house payment, you know, I got an arm or, you know, interest rates going up. My house payment maybe went up and you know, arms probably from the distant past because rates have been so good. Everybody's been doing fixed rate. But my point is, if you're not feeling good about things, you might not want to go buy the $5 latte at Starbucks. You might not want to buy the new car. You know, yours is getting a little run down. You had it in the shop a few times, thinking about maybe upgrading to a new car. Last thing you want, if you're not feeling a good, about, good about things, is another car payment. So looking at staples, on the other hand, you're going to buy no matter what. Staples are things that you need. Discretionary stocks sell us things that we want. Staples, I have yet to hear anybody say, oh my gosh, we're heading for a recession. I'm not buying any more soap. There is no way I'm going to buy another tube of toothpaste because of this recession. I've never heard anyone say that. You're still going to go out. You're going to buy those things. They don't get impacted during a recession or if the market is anticipating a recession. Buying a new car, however, buying a new house, buying a latte, buying new clothes, those are all discretionary items that you want, but in a pinch, you're not going to buy. And so looking at this relationship is really important in determining how the market feels. The market tells you every day, forget about CNBC and what they tell you, what they feel. I could care less how they feel. I want to know where the money's going. Follow the money. So here's a chart of the S&P 500. Down below, I have the XLY XLP. And then down below, that's the correlation between the two. Now, I'm going to go back and I'm going to show you. Let's go back 10 years. Look at the correlation. Now, this is daily correlation. So it's obviously going to go up and down quite a bit. But do you see, I mean, if you're, here's the zero line. Anything above the zero line is positive correlation. It means that this ratio is going in the same direction as the S&P 500. Now, if you look at that, I think you can see that, okay, there's quite a bit of positive correlation. There's some negative correlation, but do you think that it is more positively correlated or negatively correlated? And maybe to help you visualize this, and I know we're a little bit over here, but this is a good question. It's probably, it's really kind of a, important question for me, you know, to talk about, because this is, gets back to the core. I'm just going to highlight plus 0.5 to 1.0 with this blue shaded area. And then I'm going to do the same thing from minus 0.5 to minus one with red shaded area. Now, does it look a little different? Which area do you think? I mean, do you see a lot of positive correlation? Plus 0.5 to 1. 1.0 1 means they're going hand in hand. Look at how many times we're very close to 1.0. Very close. Many, many, many times. How many times have you seen us very close to minus one? I'm seeing zero times in the last 10 years. We get to minus 0.75 twice in 10 years. Heck, we almost live above plus 0 0.50. Do you see how strong this correlation is? It is so important to be following what's going on between the XLY and the XLP. And there's some people who's like, well, why the XLY? It's, you know, that's Tesla and Amazon. You know, that makes up more than 40, 45% of the XLY, why don't we use equal weighted? And my response is, okay, so you think we should treat Amazon, which employs how many, how many people in this world to some small podunk little company that maybe has $8 million in sales? You think they should be treated equally and that should be some kind of represent, representative I don't buy into all the equal weighted stuff. I think it's pointless. The stock market is capital, cap, it's, it's cap weighted. Why would we not want to look at the cap weightings of these sectors? 
you know, the, the ones that have large cap weightings. I don't understand the whole, it's, it's like people are always looking for something to tear down the market. Of course, the lower cap weighted stocks are going to be performing more poorly. That's why they're lower cap. Why is Amazon growing and growing and growing every year? Because it's a great run company. I don't know. It, I think the XLY XLP is a fantastic intermarket relationship to watch. All right. Um, last thing I'm going to do, I want to go back and show you now that uh, chart list, if I can find it. All right. So here we are. Are you ready? This is just to see what is going on with earnings. So um, let's go do a update. So here we go. Tiva up 20% in the first five minutes of trading. Chipotle, look at Chipotle, 11%. End phase energy. Someone asked me about this one yesterday. I said, I really like the chart. Up 9% pre-market. By the way, if I hit any of these pre-market or you know when the market opens, I'd take my money. And the reason being everybody's buying, market makers are shorting. Probably, I don't know what the number is, but I'm going to say eight times out of 10, you're going to see lower prices on these stocks that gap up. Now, flip side. What's not working today? Whoa, Tenable Holdings, 14%. There's Agilis. Um, but I remember Tenable Holdings from the scan that we ran. Remember, I ran the scan and then I put into this earnings with strong AD. Let's see what's going on with this one. So there's your Tenable. Already picked up 2% since the open. Let's pull this up and we'll look at Kraft and Juniper. These will be our three you must see. We'll wrap up. Look at Tenable already. That was already gone down quite a bit. It's reacted, you know, positively. Um, so there was the very early morning. These stocks can move really fast in the first half hour of trading. I showed you yesterday that med pace, right? Here, look at how quickly it went down. It bounced up $5. And then it went down another 10 or seven or eight or whatever it was. This is the kind, I usually look at this list around 10, 30, 11 o'clock. That's when I think most of the selling has probably taken place. And you might miss some of the ones that reverse early, but I want to make sure that, you know, it, that most of the selling, hopefully anyway, is out of the way. So that's the whole idea there. So let's see, let's go back. So there's Tenable. The other was Kraft. See what's going on here. Big move down intraday. And then the last one was Juniper. That one's already recovering off of an earlier uh, gap down, but I still would be careful getting in too early on these. The thing to watch, though, on these, these stocks is their AD lines. There's Juniper. Stock's been going down, but the AD line's been going up. What does that mean? That means that it tends to finish in the top half of its candle. Now, it's been gapping down a lot. It's been going lower. But from a trading perspective, intraday morning weakness many times can lead to gains in trading the stock. So that's one. KHC is the second one. Look at that AED line up near a high. Here's your gap. Combine it with other things, too. I like to look at prior support. So here's a stock. Kraft Heinz gets right down to about 35 and a half, the low 35.65, getting close to a key support level. And what I really like is for when a line, when you get an intraday move below the prior lows and it starts rallying back. Because then if I catch it early enough, I can put my stop at the day's low. If it turns back down, I just get stopped out. But a lot of times that's where you get a big reversal. The other one was tenable. And there's the AD line up near a 52 week high. Here's the move down. I think we probably, this is actually a gap down below support. Probably might be able to get this one lower, but that's just a different trading strategy. I know I'm going way over today, but I thought the questions were good. I thought this strategy is something worth discussing. But if you're not already an EB Digest subscriber, go to Earnings Beats and subscribe. We give you each one of these. Again, you go back to this uh, 
you can download the upcoming earnings for each day, just like I've done here. We also have a relative strength chart list that encompasses all five days worth. And you can search in, um, you can go back, say, in the last three months and see on a relative basis. These are all set up relative to their industry group. So you can see which stocks over the last three months are doing the best job of outperforming their peers. Let's see how many stocks are on this list. 556. That's a lot of work we do and we just hand it over to you. You gotta check this out. All right, uh, let's go back to the dashboard. Let's see what the market's doing. Dow up 161, S&P 43, NASDAQ pretty much has gotten back what it lost yesterday here in the first 10 minutes, 1.9%. Beautiful bounce off the 20 day moving average. Exactly what we talked about yesterday. Now the only question is, can, do we hold it going forward? Anyway, that's it for me. Listen, you've got um, the FOMC announcement later today, two o'clock. Uh, let's see what happens. Probably gonna be a pretty wild day after that. But I really, I'm still very bullish. I've had folks questioning, you know, these, um, the intermarket relationships, these ratios, because some of them are turning back down. It's okay if they turn back down. They're not going to go up every day. Remember, this isn't just about that either. It was about resetting sentiment. That occurred back in May and June. I think it was the June low where sentiment, the five-day moving average of put call ratio finally hit the level where we have seen every major market bottom in this century. We finally got that in June. So sentiment is to the point where we could have bottomed. It's not just about one thing. Those who are bearish just want to try and poke holes in one little thing here or there. It's a story. It's a puzzle. Anyway, that's it for me. Have a great day, everybody. Happy trading.